Thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to the uh, GWT History Museum. Um, I just want to uh, make a few quick announcements about our organization and I'm going to turn it over to the curators. But we're here tonight to celebrate our new exhibit in the permanent gallery here that faces from the past. We have always been here. Subtitle. <laughs> And, uh, so I, uh, and I want to thank Paula Lichtenberg and Golitsky. Thank you very much for curating this exhibit. <laughs> it's a wonderful addition to our, or we're kind of like creating it sort of like a timeline going around the room now, and we're gradually moving out uh, some of the new exhibits. Uh, we also have um, oh, Will. Uh, Will's new exhibit here, the uh, leather exhibit, which is one of you. I'm going to get off the stage so we can uh, turn it over to our wonderful panelists tonight. I'm excited that we're going to have Paula Lichtenberg first, and uh, then we're going to have Will Murdoch talk. Uh, pardon me? Roscoe, excuse me. Will Roscoe and, uh, and others. So I'm going to turn it over to Paula and I'll let her handle the logistics on that. Thank you, everyone, for being here. and under uh, reported on and what we found was we had way too much uh, for this space uh, even um, but and very little in our archives actually uh, a lot of the uh, collection uh, mugshots and postcards and other material is, is uh, from uh, Bill's personal collection, uh, some of mine. Uh, so uh, this is this is just a period that uh, needs a lot of uh, more uh, research, and I encourage anyone who uh, is interested uh, to to dig because what we found was there is a, a ton of uh, information out there. Did you want to? Uh, no. Sure. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it, it, it's my great pleasure this evening to, to say to you the second most beautiful phrase in the English language. There's free food and drink and water. <laughs> so please feel free, I don't think you can get out of here, but please feel free to help yourself. Maybe one of the, the people will be by with it in a, a little while. Um, the great, wonderful Dorothy Parker once said, uh, wrote, as I get ever older and toddle toward the tomb, I find that I care less and less who goes to bed with whom. I say, Bologna. I want the names, I want the details, where are the Polaroids, let's bring it in and see what's going on. What else have we got to talk about? You know, how many Facebook cats can you look at? As much as I cats. The people we have on the wall, which is a very small percentage of the number of people um, that we could even find out about, saw the world differently than we did. They were not us without uh, cell phones and other kinds of modern conveniences, but they saw, and they might have seen themselves differently, but they still were people. The uh, human behavior hasn't changed, just the way we, we think about it has changed. They saw human behavior differently than we do, I mean, just in my lifetime. The way we have talked about human behavior has changed. I've gone from having a perversion to having a mental illness, to having a sexual uh, preference, which we're not going to talk about, <laughs> to having a sexual orientation, and now, you know, amazingly, I'm normal. 
<laughs> I actually like having the privilege. <laughs> that only took several hundred thousand dollars. No. <laughs> I actually like having the perversion better because that was certainly much more fun, more interesting, more exciting, more dangerous. And you got some, some nice people. So tonight we're going to hear about some nice people who didn't necessarily think of themselves as having a preference or uh, uh, a gender identification or anything else, but they knew who they were and they knew with whom they wanted to be. You've got people like Charles Stoddard and even Clinton, who was a famous Broadway leading man at one time. Uh, and they had a relationship that Stoddard wrote that was too intense to last. That was San Francisco in the 1870s. Stoddard said, I am as my nature made me. Now, whether that was a perversion or that was an orientation or whatever, I don't know. So take a look at these folks and let's hear about some other folks uh, this evening with the panel. So thank you. Thank you. And um, as I said, there's so much more that we couldn't fit in. So what we decided would be a good way to talk more about uh, our history is having panels. And this is the first of a series of panels. Um, in September, um, Amy. Uh, uh, Sudoshi will be doing a program on Charles Warren uh, Stoddard and uh, his connections to uh, Yoni Noguchi and to the Bohemian Club. And in November, uh, Michael Helquist and I um, hope to be doing uh, a program on um, uh, Dr. Mary Sperry and Gail Laughlin, who were uh, in our exhibit. and. Uh, Dr. Marie Equi, who he wrote about, and about um, lesbian uh, uh, hypnosis and how these evil <laughs> lesbians have uh, <laughs> taken over uh, the uh, daughters and how the mothers have uh, sued to, uh, to keep their uh, the wills and inheritances from the these dominating lesbians. So I think that will be another uh, good one. And then over the course of the, the years, we hope to uh, have more uh, panels. Um, so quickly, before I introduce our panelists, uh, tonight is Bastille Day. And I wanted to uh, mention a couple of the French faces from the past. Uh, in the exhibit, we have uh, Jean Benet, the frog catcher who um, was from Paris. Um, some other people we didn't uh, get in because of space. Uh, Francois Pioche, who's also a Parisian, and uh, very likely uh, gay. He was uh, a, a wealthy philanthropist, not a philanthropist, a financier. And uh, he and his partner, also <coughs> unmarried, uh, lived together. Um, <coughs> He um, financed wharves and uh, railroads and all kinds of uh, projects, the, the Market Street Railway. They also, he was also uh, into real estate, and he and his partner, uh, that he lived, who he lived with, um, owned Rancho San Miguel, which covered a large portion of uh, the western part of San Francisco. And they also, um, including Noe Valley and Eureka Valley, so um, they had homesteads where uh, working class people could purchase homes. Um, there was uh, the Noe Garden Union up around 22nd Street. It was a Corbett, Corbett um, Homestead Association um, on Market and Corbett. So some of us may be living on land that was developed by, um, by a gay man. Um, there were also the lesbians from San Francisco Bay Area who became famous in France. There was um, Anna Klemke was an artist 
um, from San Francisco, uh, who was the companion of uh, the more famous artist Rosa Bonheur um, for 10 years they lived together. <coughs> um, Harriet Levy went to to France with her neighbor from uh, from O'Farrell Street, uh, the, uh, the um, her neighbor um, Alice Tonkless introduced Alice to a family friend from the East Bay, Gertrude Stein, and um, that was the end of uh, Harriet's. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there was a lot of connection with. Uh, with France and uh, gay people and, you know, happy Bastille Day. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'd like to um, introduce our, uh, our two speakers. Um, first, <coughs> Will Roscoe, uh, who's been an, activ an activist and an independent scholar for many years. He's written about and worked with Harry Hay and the Radical Fairies and written extensively on uh, gay American Indians. Um, he won the Lambda and uh, Margaret Mead Award for his book, Zuni Man Woman. And he's uh, um, one of the first programs that I recall going to at the Historical Society was his slideshow on Awiwa, the Zuni Man Woman. So um, he's going to be talking about uh, Queen Calipia and also about uh, some of the uh, some of the um, Berdash, uh, two spirits uh, who were part of our early history, and um, then we'll have a short uh, Q and A, and uh, then we'll uh, go to Claire Sears, who's an associate professor of sociology and sex uh, sexuality at San Francisco State. And I'm checking it. Yes, I'm, I'm, I've got to write some more. And, um, and with the research and interest in critical criminology, queer theory, transgender studies, and historical methods and disability studies. Um, she has a PhD from UC Santa Cruz and a Fulbright Fellowship and also a postdoctoral fellowship from the, from the University of uh, California. Um, <coughs> And among her publications are the highly regarded Arresting Dress, which uh, I found very helpful in putting together our exhibit, uh, Cross-Dressing Law and Fascination in 19th Century San Francisco. And uh, she's uh, just written a chapter on the forthcoming uh, 19th Century Queer History in the Rutledge History of Queer America. So. Um, that's where we are uh, in our program, and uh, they'll, they'll each talk about 20, 25 minutes, and then um, you can ask questions. And they have some books, if, uh, if you'd like to uh, speak to them afterwards about uh, purchasing. You, you do? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, take it away, uh, Will. <laughs> uh, Paul had contacted me when she was creating the exhibit, uh, and um, when I got the chance to see it, um, I was uh, struck and delighted to see the modern bust of Queen Califia that's in the case over here. Um, I had in my book, um, Changing Ones, Third and Fourth Genders in Native North America, talked briefly about some connections between uh, early Spanish accounts of uh, uh, conquistadors um, uh, searching for Amazons and how uh, a fictional Amazon came to provide the name for California. Uh, and when I saw that, I thought, well, I'm going to go home and write up these notes for Paula, and, and she can use them. Uh, and you know, one thing led to another. So I, I and I ended up writing more than a couple pages this this short paper, um, and it's really just a sort of set piece. There's not a whole lot here, but um, uh, there is some really uh, interesting connections um, and a different story about the origin of California. Um, before I start, I want to say that I'm 
dedicating this paper to the memory of Michael Sosi, a friend and colleague. Um, Michael is, uh, was an anthropologist um, and a member of the Mojave tribe who uh, found the photograph we'll be seeing later, which is still the only known photograph of a traditional Native American two-spirit woman. Um, and the story of it is, uh, you know, I, I, will, I will share it. Um, he brought the photograph to show me on the day that my partner, Bradley Rose, passed away. And friends were gathering, and uh, he came to join us, and he had this photograph with him. And so there we were looking at it. Um, in the days and weeks after that, he stayed in close touch, was a major source of support. Um, and one day he showed up at my uh, door with um, a whole set of new bedding, sheets, blankets, pillowcases. In the Mojave tradition, when someone passed away, you, you burn their bedding. Uh, actually, in, in traditional times, you burn the whole house. Uh, and it was a part of a process of, of a traditional process of grieving. Uh, he kept me focused on this photograph. He brought me all of his own personal collection of ethnographic publications, and then he proposed that we actually go to, on a trip down to Los Angeles to the Southwest Museum to look at it, look at the catalog information, and whatever else we could find about it. So uh, it was all of that kind of then led me to, to do the book I just showed to you. Um, it gave me something to do at a, a very difficult period of time, and he was a, a very dear friend, passed away a couple years ago, um, much, much too early. All right. In 1524, Hernán Cortés was at the peak of his fame and power. Three years earlier, through guile, luck, and violence, he had crushed the Aztec Empire. The Holy Roman Emperor, King Charles V, appointed him governor, captain general, and chief justice of New Spain of the Ocean Sea. But his penchant for defying orders and making enemies, and indeed his impotence towards the king himself, had weakened his standing. He yearned to undertake conquests in lands north of the Aztecs, but the crown had sent a rival instead to colonize the region. So on October 15, Cortes sat down and had a letter to the king complaining bitterly of being the victim of conspiracies and dangling alluring promises of the new conquests he was prepared to undertake and the riches he would bring for the Spanish Empire. Most tantalizing was a report from his trusted lieutenant, Gonzalo de Sandoval. In 1522, he had sent Sandoval into western Mexico with instructions to visit the towns and people of those provinces and to bring to me all the reports and secrets of the land he might learn. <coughs> Sandoval traveled as far as the shores of the South Sea, the Pacific Ocean, where he founded the city of Colima before proceeding north along the coast. Reaching the town of Zihuatlan in the present state of Jalisco, the lords of the province gave him a report in which there was affirmed to be an island inhabited by women without any men, although at certain times they are, said they are visited by men from the mainland. And if the women bear female children, they are protected, but if males, they are driven from their society. This island is ten days' journeys from that province, and many have gone there and seen it. They also tell me it is very rich in pearls and gold, respecting which I shall labor to obtain the truth and to give your majesty a full account of it. <coughs> and indeed, Sandoval returned with pearls in hand. Cortes waited no time. He dispatched his cousin to Colima with instructions to look for a district inhabited by women without men, where, in the matter of reproduction, these women follow the practices of the Amazons described in the Historia Antiguas, or ancient histories. Cortes' letter was calculated to get the royal court's attention, that an island of riches inhabited by women who lived without men might exist was not a new fantasy for the Spaniards. The Greek myth of a tribe of women, the Amazons, living on the margins of the civilized world had persisted through the Middle Ages. At the time, the Spaniards arrived in the New World, an island of women 
was the subject of one of the most popular novels in the history of Spanish literature. First published in 1510, Las Cervas de Esplandian, translated as The Labors of the Very Brave Knight Esplandian, was the second of two romantic potboilers written by Prophecy Rodriguez de Montalvo. Drawing on old medieval chivalry tales, La Cernes de Esplandian was a runaway bestseller. Over the course of 21 chapters, Montalvo gives an account of an island in California, which was inhabited by black women without a single man among them, and that they lived in the manner of Amazons. The island everywhere abounds with gold and precious stones. Whenever a man came to the island, he was promptly killed and eaten. <laughs> <laughs> its ruler was a queen named Calithia. In fact, stories of New World Amazons had long been making their way back to Spain, well before La Cercestia Splandia was published. Columbus relayed reports of an island of women engaged in men's pursuit in his official account of, the, of his first voyage. It is quite possible that these reports inspired Montalvo. In any case, they kept coming. In 1517, while sailing along the shoreline of Cozumal, Juan de Grijalva's expedition found a tower on a tip of the island, of the land, that is said to be inhabited by women who live without men. When Cortés departed from Cuba to meet his destiny in Mexico the following year, his instructions included, <clears throat> among other things, to get hold of an informant who will give you news about other islands, and you will also inquire where and in what direction are the Amazons. The soldiers with Cortes knew Montalvo's books well. Bernard Diaz, who chronicled Cortes's exploits, recalled how at first sight of the great city of Tenochtitlan, the Spaniards could not help remarking to each other that all these buildings resembled the fairy castles we read of in Amadis de Gaulle, Montalvo's first novel. Meanwhile, back in Spain, Cortes's letter backfired. The crown was certainly interested in pearls, gold, and new territories, Amazons or no, but authorization to undertake their conquest was not forthcoming. Meanwhile, Cortes was called away to suppress a revolt in Honduras. When he returned to Mexico in 1526, he found himself mired in controversies largely of his own making. He was suspended from the office of governor and banished from Mexico City. Then his arch enemy, Nuno Beltran de Guzman, accused him of poisoning his rivals. <coughs> Cortes hurriedly left for Spain to defend his name. When he returned in 1530, he was still shorn of the title of governor, but now he had a royal contract to find the islands of the South Sea. Meanwhile, events on the ground had overtaken him. On December 21, 1529, Nuno de Guzman would set out with a force of more than 300 conquistadors and some 8,000 Nahua allies into the lands west of New Spain to find the pearls and gold of the Amazons. The expedition was, in the words of one historian, a genocidal enterprise. Guzman attacked the natives' villages, stole their food, raised and burned their dwellings, and tortured their leaders to make them reveal the location of their riches. In July 1530, he had reached Obitlan on the western Mexican coast, where he wrote the king, I shall go to find the Amazons, which some say dwell on the sea, some in an arm of the sea, and that they are rich, and account of, accounted of by the people for goddesses. <coughs> Guzman ravaged his way up the coast until he reached Cihuatlan, where Sandoval had heard of an island of women, gold, and pearls. But the only women Guzman found were cowering in fear and clutching their children. The men had fled to the mountains. There were no pearls or gold. Such news might have discouraged another man, but Guzman's denouement only emboldened Cortes. Now it was his chance to find the island of women and their riches. Between 1532 and 1539, he mounted no less than five expeditions to that end, all financed at his own expense, all ending in disaster and disappointment. In 1532, he sent two ships under Diego Hurtado Mendoza into the seas off the coast of western Mexico, 
to find out whether the natives were adorned with gold pearls or precious stones. One ship mutinied, the second disappeared without a trace. The following year, he sent two more ships under Diego de Becerra to find Mendoza. Again, a, a revolt broke out. De Serra was killed. When the mutineers turned back to Mexico, they came upon an island they named Santa Cruz, which, according to all accounts, there were fine pearl fisheries. Its inhabitants, however, were a, quote, savage tribe of Indians who attacked and killed the landing party. As the survivors straggled back to Mexico, stories of the newfound island of per pearls reached Cortes, who, in the words of Governor Diaz, felt a great temptation to visit the above-mentioned Pearl Island. The conquistador now took matters into his own hands. In the spring of 1535, he set sail with three ships and 380 soldiers and settlers for the island of Santa Cruz. On May 3, he landed at present de La Paz, claimed the land for the king, and founded the town. Then two of his ships ran aground. Awaiting their return, Cortes ran out of supplies and his men began starving to death. According to Bernardo Diaz, in order not to witness these miseries, he left Santa Cruz to discover other lands and came upon California, which is a bay. The men Cortes abandoned at Santa Cruz clung on for almost two years, a miserable colony on the coast of a barren peninsula where there were neither poor pearls nor, nor gold, let alone a queen named Califia. It took one more expedition in 1539 under Francisco de, U de, U de Ulloa, there we go, <laughs> up the coast of Baja, California to convince Cortes of that fact. By now, he had expended 300,000 pesos of his own funds. In the words of one Spanish historian, no man ever wasted money on such enterprises with so much zeal. <laughs> <clears throat> Hoping for royal reimbursement, he left for Spain in 1541 and never returned to Mexico. Whether Cortes himself called his discovery California is uncertain. The name first appears in documentary records in 1541. The Spaniards continued to apply it to the landscape as they steadily expanded their empire northward, first to denote, to, denote, to denote a bay, then an island, then a peninsula thought to be an island, and finally to the vast region facing the Pacific coast from Cabo San Lucas to the 42nd parallel. In the histories Euro-Americans have written about Spain in America, the naming of California is often cited as a case in point. How the romanticism, <coughs> superstition, gullibility, and greed that drove Spanish conquest doomed their empire to a long demise and in its aftermath, a string of failed states, mired in backwardness, enthralled by Catholicism, beset with dictators. It is true the Spaniards injured the New World with rampant imaginations. But there are other voices outside Western discourse, Anglo or Hispanic, that whisper between the lines of the text, texts conquistadors and historians have written, that of the indigenous American people. To hear them, we have to retrace the steps of Sandoval back to Siwatlan in 1522 and ask, what did the lords of that region, perhaps the Protopecha Indians, tell him? On close reading, Sandoval's account has only two elements of Montalvo's story. <coughs> that somewhere nearby, there was an island inhabited by women without any men, and that the island was very rich in pearls and gold. There is no mention of warrior women or a queen. Apparently, native Mexicans have their own traditions about women who lived without men. They may have reminded the Spaniards of their own mythologies, but were distinct from them. <clears throat> we might begin by noting that Siwatlan, a compound of the Nuaro words Zikwa and Tlan, literally means place of women. Even more revealing is an account from an anonymous soldier who accompanied Guzman in 1530. <laughs> Many women from Siwatlan, he states, very different from any seen before, were taken prisoner. Speaking through an interpreter, they said they had arrived by sea and in ancient times, they kept the custom of having no husbands. 
but they received neighboring men from time to time for intercourse. And women who bore sons buried them alive while keeping their daughters to bring them up. At present, however, they no longer killed their male infants, but raised them until they were 10, then gave them to their fathers. In other words, the stories of women who lived without men were stories told by the native women of Siwatlan. This is consistent with the argument of Dana Roja in Return to Atzla. In attributing the Spaniards' will to conquest, to romantic tales they brought with them to the New World, Anglo-American historians have overlooked the extent to which native discourse informed their quests. For indigenous people throughout central Mexico, the region to the north of the Aztec Empire was an origin point, where there was another city as marvelous as Tenochtitlan, from which their ancestors had come, as documented in numerous surviving native codices in both pictures and text. Cortes, among others, knew these sources, and the native informants he questioned knew them as well. Thus, the Spaniards, along with the thousands of Indian auxiliaries that joined their expeditions, were retracing the ancestral Mexica migration. Now, the, what we're looking at here is a map from 1580 by a Portuguese cartographer, um, which is it's, it's beautiful on its own. It has gold uh, foil, and et cetera, on it. But um, it has uh, no less than three pairs of warrior women in the western New Mexico area. And the other elements is sort of like uh, blue neuron things that you see. <coughs> the lower one is a depiction of Tenochtitlan. Uh, and it's done in a way that is similar iconographically to uh, the way the city was portrayed in um, codices or scrolls that native artists made. And then the other one represents the um, mythical city of origin, which was believed to be connected by a river. Um, uh, so you have here two dimensions of the native mythological world uh, that the Spaniards stepped into and began to participate in as they conducted their conquests. The people of Siwatlan, as everywhere, took their mythologies to be true stories. What a myth of an alternative society of women without men represented to them, what cultural tensions or memories it expressed or mediated, we can only guess at this distance. But in having such traditions, the people of Siwatlan were not alone. <clears throat> In 1605, Fray Francisco de Escobar wrote an account of his journey with Don Juan de Oñate from northern New Mexico to the mouth of the Colorado River. It is as fantastic a tale as any told in the long history of Spanish discovery narratives. Throughout the region, the native people, ancestors of the human-speaking tribes who live there today, told him stories of monstrosities that he could hardly believe. And yet, he mused, since so many and different people testified to them, they cannot lack foundation. There were stories of a nation of men whose penises were so long they wrapped them four times around their waists. <laughs> a nation of people who had only one foot. Another, not far from the last, who slept underwater. Another in trees. Yet another that lived on the odor of food alone. <laughs> and all these nations lay along a river not far away. But Escobar saves the best for last. Just a few journeys distant, he was told, there was an island. <clears throat> the principal person obeyed by the people who lived on the island was a woman whom they called Zinyaka Kohota, which signifies or means principal woman or woman chief. From all these Indians, we learned that she was a giantess and that on the island she had only a sister and no other person of her race, which must have died out with her. Another account, three decades later, gives the island a name, Zinyogaba. The myth of the Amazons was alive again. In 1608, Father Antonio de Ascension, who had been on an expedition that had sailed north as far as Monterey, <coughs> 
wrote a letter to the king with an account of an Amazon island redolent with allusions to Mondalbo. Quoting a report from one of Oñate's officers who had contact with the natives, Ascension wrote, they also made signs that in an island nearby in the middle of the sea, there was a noted large town of which an Amazon Indian, half giantess, who wears on her breast a very precious plate of pearls and who is accustomed to take them ground up in her drinks, his queen. <coughs> These Indians said there were many pearls in that sea, the greatest quantity being found around the island of the Amazon queen. As for silver, Escobar adds, they say that the Amazon queen possesses it. It comes from the island of California. By 1656, an Ile de Gigante had found its way onto an early French map, which locates it between the island of California and the coast of western New Mexico and north of the Rio del Norte, the Colorado River, <clears throat> misplaced several hundred miles south of its actual location. Again, we have a text to which the words of native people are quoted, interpreted, and perhaps misunderstood altogether by Europeans who do not speak their languages nor understand their world views. Yet what makes these stories intriguing is that the traditions of the human-speaking tribes of the Colorado River, recorded nearly three centuries later by anthropologists, not only tell of powerful mythological warrior women, but of a social role for individuals born female who were both warriors and shamans, a role now termed two-spirit. Gender diversity was a notable feature of human societies. In 1540, Hernando de Arcon just, uh, observed that there were among these Indians three or four men dressed as women. These were male two spirits, called Elkia among the Cocopa, Elksa among the Kachan, Alya among the Mojave, and Yelyaksai among the Maricopa a role for females who expressed male traits and mastered male skills is documented as well. They were called Warhame in Cocopa, Kwehrame in Kachan, Kwame in Mojave, and Kwiroxame in Maricopa. They engaged in men's work, hunting, farming, and warfare. They typically dressed as men did and married women. Throughout the region, Male and female two spirits were credited with mythological origins and certain spiritual powers. The mythology of the Tipai tribe prominently features a female two spirit. In this myth, the god Mastanho creates humans in a place called Wakami. He assigns them to four tribes and instructs them to disperse. The Tipai migrate south with the Kachan, then go on alone to the Salton Sea. Other troops continue. Uh, groups continue west to become the Ipai, a people who have no seeds and live by hunting and gathering alone. At this point, Mastamho sends a figure called Warhame, <coughs> cognate with the Kokoko word for female two spirits, Warhame, who, who is described as half man, half woman, along with a pair of male twins collectively named Matkwahomai. Together, they bring seeds and agriculture to the Ipai. As they travel along the Colorado River, they collect feathers for headdresses and then paint their faces for war. When they arrive in the Imperial Valley, the Tipai flee except for one woman who marries one of the twins. The twins then give the Tipai clans weapons and instructions in their use. Here, the two-spirit goddess Wahami is a culture bearer who brings the arts of agriculture and war. Figures from other human tribes share traits with her. A Havasupai goddess provides seeds. The Mojave Nyohaiba is a woman warrior associated with twin gods. She instructs the people in the use of war feathers and paint and institutes a war dance led by four Alya, male two spirits. Other human goddesses, like the one Escobar was told of, are said to live in the ocean, usually in the west. The Mojave, Kwa Ayuka Inyohada, or Old Woman of the West, and the Yavapai, Komwida Papuya. As for the name of the island, Zinyogaba, the anthropologist Alfred Prober speculated that it was a contraction of the Mojave terms, then Yaaka Woman, 
and Ava house, while Zinyaka Kahota is woman chief. In other words, despite the fantastic nature of his overall account, in this instance, Escobar appears to have accurately recorded a native term. Reports from the 1890s mention a Kachan Parame, or female two-spirit, who was married to a woman. She may be the figure in this photograph taken in the same period. It is the only known photograph of a traditional Native American female two-spirit. It depicts an imposing woman, hand on hip, wearing only a man's breechcloth and the bogards of a warrior on her wrists. <clears throat> the massive amount of shell bead jewelry she is wearing, which perhaps the conquistador might have imagined to be pearls, indicates wealth and high status. On the great seal of California, a martial goddess gazes serenely upon a pastoral scene. The snow-tipped peaks of the Sierra Nevada rise in the distance. Below is a placid San Francisco Bay, dotted with ships moored in its islands, a diminutive grizzly bear lumbering at the goddess's feet. She is Minerva, the Roman goddess of war and wisdom. On her shield is the face of the man-killing ogre Medusa. In light of the origin of California, one might wonder why the state seal does not give pride of place to its eponym, the Queen of the Amazons. <clears throat> but then one remembers. Califia and her two spirit sisters were dark-skinned. Perhaps the time has come to replace the myth of California with a bit of actual history and honor the complex origins of its name and its links to the female two spirits who flourished in America <clears throat> long before Garci Rodriguez de Montalvo penned his romantic fantasy of Amazons, islands, and gold. <coughs> Sidewalk near you, perhaps in front of the dildo store, I don't know, <laughs> will be a plaque honoring the Zuni Two Spirit Way One. They have the signature of the, of the person being honored by the plaque, and they came to me looking for the signature for a week long. And Will was able to actually track it down. And do wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, normally I would have just, the yeah, response would have been, What are you talking about? <laughs> this is a person who um, lived uh, in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, very few Native people were writing uh, at that time, especially uh, people who uh, had never left, well, way would have indeed left the, the village. Um, but it just so happened, and I had only learned of this a couple years prior, um, from a massive book published on Zuni pottery. I, I, I wrote a book about Wewa called The Zuni Man Woman, and um, I knew that Wewa was a master potter and had. Um, uh, had several had had pieces collected for the National Museum and was in effect commissioned to make certain pieces, and I thought you know I I, I mean I didn't think I would find anything signed but I thought you know if I uh, I should go to this place and see what I could find see if, if there's any record that identifies a pot because just like finding the first picture of a two spirit <coughs> which was one of the pictures of Wewa, and when I thought there were none, um, to find an object known to have been made by a traditional two-spirit would have been thrilling, but I just didn't have the resources to do that research. Well, someone has done it, and there are two pots you could, they can't quite really see what, what's going on here. They have signatures on them. Now, the W is, looks like an M, but if you had only rudimentary 
English, you might make that kind of mistake. Otherwise, it is spelled uh, one of the ways that it was often spelled in the 19th century. So it's really kind of a fluke. And it is perhaps very well, as far as I know, the first pot made by a Native American potter to have been signed. Native American potters did not sign their pots until the 1930s or 40s. So um, with Paula telling about time, yeah. do we have a couple questions or yeah, anything to go? Questions. If there are, I mean, I don't, you know, whatever. Yeah, I, have, I have a I have question. Um, in, the, in the map there, where you, where you have the uh, sort of nucleus things, are those, are those uh, empty spots? Is that the way they're, they're, you know? Kind of, map, like but it map. is the way that, um, that native artists betrayed mm -hmm. the city of you know, Pinochtitlan at that time. Um, and uh, how that got to this Portuguese map maker, uh, but, but some of these codices were coming out of Spain and were being seen and passed around. Is one other question. Um, uh, the, you were talking about the 40 second, um, what, what was the, uh, what was it called? That was like, <laughs> I guess, long like, uh, parallel, parallel, excuse me. Oh. Thank you, <laughs> What, so oh, you have any idea what that was? That's that was? Oregon. I mean, oh, okay. yeah, okay. Spanish uh, <coughs> Empire extended more or less to the border of Oregon. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, thank you all so much. <laughs>
or shall make any indecent exposure of his or her person, or be guilty of any lewd or indecent act or behavior, or shall exhibit or perform any indecent, immoral, or lewd play, or other representation. He should be guilty of a misdemeanor, and on conviction shall pay a fine not exceeding $500. <laughs> so as, as this suggests, um, the Board of Supervisors did not criminalize cross-dressing as a distinct offense, but as one manifestation of the much broader offense of indecency that also um, included public nudity, indecent exposure, lewd acts, and immoral performances. Um, in turn, this wide-reaching indecency law um, was not a standalone pro prohibition, but was one part of a new chapter of the municipal code book, like the local law book, that targeted offenses against good morals and, in, uh, good morals and decency. Um, the other um, indecent acts criminalized in there were public intoxication, profane language, and bathing in the bay without appropriate clothing. <laughs> <laughs> and alongside these various indecencies, um, Cross-dressing was, was the first um, indecent act to be outlawed in San Francisco. So from the very beginning of San Francisco local law, cross-dressing was there as an offense. Now, despite its roots in indecency law, um, San Francisco's cross-dressing law soon became a flexible tool for policing multiple gender transgressions. And by the end of the century, um, San Francisco police had made over 100 arrests. Um, those arrested um, included uh, feminist dress reformers, female impersonators, uh, fast young women who would dress up as men for a good night out on the town, and people whose gender identifications did not match their legal sex. Um, people who today we may think of as transgender, although that's not necessarily how they would think of themselves. Um, people who were arrested under cross-dressing law faced uh, public exposure, police harassment, and up to six months in jail which was the maximum penalty permitted under state law at that time. Um, by the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, people arrested under cross-dressing law also risked psychiatric institutionalization and deportation if they were not US citizens. And I just want to take a minute now to just share a couple of those stories with you. All right, so um, in October 1890, a judge sent a person who alternately used the names Dick and Mammy Rubel um, to the state insane asylum for wearing men's clothing on a body that the police judged to be female. In court, Rubel disputed this gender assignment and explained to the judge, I'm neither a man nor a woman, and I've got no sex at all. The judge interpreted this claim as clear evidence of insanity and sent Rubel for an indefinite term to the Stockton State Asylum. Um, here, the admitting doctor noted that Rubel, quote, imagines she is a hermaphrodite, wears male clothing, wishes to have legal authority to wear men's clothing. Um, this, again, was seen as evidence of insanity and it doomed Rubel to life in the asylum. Um, they remained there for 18 years until dying from tuberculosis in 1908. Um, I also want to tell you um, about this person. Um, this is a young Mexican-American woman named Geraldine Portica, um, who was also arrested by San Francisco police for violating cross-dressing law in 1917 um, for wearing women's clothing on a body the police judged to be male. Um, when Rubel, um, sorry, when uh, Portica was arrested, um, the police took this photograph of her, and as you can see, it's quite different from the standard mugshot photographs that were usually taken. Um, and there was a handwritten caption that accompanied the photograph. Um, and it says, this is not a girl, but a boy, who was reared by his mother as a girl, and is always dressed as a girl, and went to school as a girl, and has never associated with anybody else but girls and was employed as a chambermaid on 6th Street when arrested. He is a native of Mexico and speaks several <coughs> languages, his English with the Spanish accent. He is now waiting to be deported to Mexico by the US government. 
So San Francisco's cross-dressing law marked the start of this new regulatory approach um, to gender transgressions in the city, from a kind of draw on fixes boundary between normative and non-normative gender during a period of rapid social change. Um, however, cross-dressing law not only signaled a new object of regulation, like non-normative gender, but also a new mechanism of regulation, exclusion from public space. So from its inception, cross-dressing law specifically targeted public gender displays, and it did not target cross-dressing in private. Instead, it produced this kind of public-private divide <coughs> through which cross-dressing could be managed. And let me give, me, give you another example to kind of illustrate that. So in the 1890s, um, a San Franciscan who identified as a woman named Jenny um, reported that although she preferred to wear women's clothing, she only did do so in private for fear of arrest on the city streets because legally she was male. Um, in a letter to the German sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld, Jenny wrote, only because of the arbitrary actions of the police do I wear men's clothing outside of the house. Skirts are a sanctuary to me, and I would rather keep on women's clothing forever if it were allowed on the street. As this suggests then, cross-dressing law did much more than police the types of clothing that ostensibly belonged to each sex. It also used the visible market of clothing to police the types of people who belonged in city space. Now, in policing the terms of urban belonging, cross-dressing law dovetailed with a host of other local laws that were also concerned with the public visibility of what I term problem bodies, particularly those of Chinese immigrants, prostitutes, and people who were deemed maimed or diseased. So some of these laws sought to directly exclude problem bodies from public space. That was the case for cross-dressing law. It was also the case for an 1867 begging law that prohibited anybody who was maimed, deformed, diseased, or I quote, an otherwise unsightly or disgusting object from appearing in public. Okay. It was also the case for an 1869 law that banned people from carrying baskets on poles through the city street, which is a common way of moving through public space among some Chinese immigrant workers. Um, a second set of laws operated through confinement rather than exclusion, seeking to ban problem bodies from particular neighborhoods. So uh, there are a whole series of laws in the 1880s and 1890s that targeted um, prostitution in middle class residential neighborhoods. You know, at that time, prostitution was really kind of like spread throughout the city. But there were these series of laws that said you could not practice prostitution in these particular blocks, these middle class residential blocks, and thus kind of like drove prostitution into this newly emerging and legally constructed racialized vice district. Another type of legal in intervention required the concealment of problem bodies from the respectable public's view. So in 1865, for example, the chief of police attempted to reduce the visibility of prostitution in Chinatown by requiring um, crib owners to buy and erect large screens at the entrance of the streets that housed prostitutes so as to, quote, hide the vice and degradation from women and children who passed by on the new downtown streetcar. And um, finally, there were several legal attempts to bypass intra-city boundaries and just remove problem bodies from the city entirely. Um, these attempts were aimed exclusively at Chinese immigrants, and from the 1850s to the 1880s, there were numerous efforts to remove all Chinese residents from the city by declaring the whole of Chinatown a public nuisance. So this was actually a report um, by the local government, by San Francisco Board of Supervisors, declaring the whole of Chinatown a nuisance, and then trying to use the power granted by nuisance laws to just remove everybody. Um, those efforts ultimately failed. Um, but an 1865 law to remove Chinese houses of ill fame from the city did succeed and resulted in the removal of 130 Chinese women from the city in one year. Oh, 
Now, undoubtedly, there are really important differences between these laws, as well as um, differences in the ways that cross-dress and indecent and insightly and immigrant bodies became identified as problems and targeted for legal intervention. But I want to bring them together here as they were brought together in the municipal code book for a couple of main reasons. So first, when we like think about these laws together, um, it becomes clear that cross-dressing law was not alone in its attempt um, to minimize the public visibility of problem bodies. Um, but it was one part of this broader legal matrix that was also concerned with race, citizenship, and disease, as well as gender transgressions. Um, moreover, these were not independent concerns. Um, as many, many scholars have persuasively argued before me, um, accusations of gender and sexual deviance were frequently deployed in processes of racialization, um, while racialized anxieties have informed the policing of gender and sex. Um, in turn, race, gender, and sex have all been linked to disease, and in 19th century San Francisco, the management of public health was key to policing Chinese immigrants and prostitutes. In short, there were numerous intersecting cultural anxieties during this period and beyond um, that become much more apparent when we situate cross-dressing law in its bigger um, legal context. Um, second, this broader context makes clear the ways that cross-dressing law was not only concerned with managing gender, but also with managing city space. Um, according to the legal historian Lawrence Friedman, 19th century municipal laws generally tolerated manifestations of vice as long as vice remained in an underground state. And that's true. Um, but in San Francisco, before vice could remain in an underground state, those underground spaces had to be created. San Francisco was a new city. Right? Um, so these types of laws, these like anti-indecency laws, and cross dressing laws, take place played a key role in creating those spaces by drawing a series of boundaries between public, private, respectable vice, um, on display, hidden, concealed. And in doing so then, um, these laws not only used city space to um, police problem bodies, but also impacted the urban environment, imbuing particular spaces and particular neighborhoods with racialized, sexualized, and gendered meanings, and of course we still see that today. Um, policing problem bodies through spatial regulation though, could have really ironic effects in that it kind of incited or created a kind of cultural fascination and a desire to see some of you are giggling, <laughs> right, which entrepreneurs could then exploit. So one manifestation of this was the popular slumming tour um, that guided tourists through the Barbary Coast and through Chinatown to glimpse the bodies that the law claims to want to hide. Um, so these tours, which are actually often run by off-duty police officers, um, took in sites like brothels, opium dens, dive bars, and even sick rooms that housed Chinese patients who were bad from the city's hospitals. Another manifestation of this kind of fascination that could be generated through legal prohibition um, was the Dying Museum Freak Show. And this rested on a different kind of movement of problem bodies from the street to the stage. Uh, that's what I want to talk about now. So this is an ad for um, a dime museum in San Francisco that was down on Market Street near Montgomery and called the Pacific Museum of Anatomy and Science. There were actually many, many more street shows and dime museums in San Francisco. They just didn't leave the, the same kinds of materials. So similar to municipal law, the Dime Museum Freak Show was a key 19th century institution that was preoccupied with the public appearance of non-normative bodies. Um, as a popular entertainment venue, it offered a variety of attractions for the low price of one dime. Here it was one dollar. <laughs> um, and they included human anatomy exhibits, lectures on morality, sideshow circus performers, and freak shows. Um, th this type of entertainment centered on performances of bodily difference and paid particularly close attention to bodies that challenged gender and racial boundaries or that ostensibly revealed the penalties for immorality through spectacles of disease and deformity. 
So for example, anatomy exhibits frequently included hermaphrodite bodies with particular close attention to genitals, while live features typically included a bearded lady. <coughs> Another staple attraction was the popular missing link or what is it exhibit, which usually featured an African American or a white man in blackface who was presented as the missing link between man and an animal. Many um, museums also featured pathology rooms that contained displays of diseased sexual organs and other body parts, which were damaged by syphilis, gonorrhea, or, quote, uh, um, the filthy habit of self-abuse. Um, finally, dime museums regularly staged performances of racialized national dominance that corresponded to contemporary laws. So as this very brief review um, suggests, the freak show and the law shared a common set of cultural anxieties concerning the shifting boundaries of gender, race, disease, and the nation. But the relationship between the freak show and um, the law was really complex, not, be not least because the law um, prohibited the public display of problem bodies, while the freak show required their public <coughs> display. Um, so to examine these tensions in a little bit more detail in a specific relation to cross-dressing law, I want to turn now to the story of Milton Madsen. And those of you who are, um, pay close attention to 19th century queer history may already know the story of Milton Madsen. Um, but if you don't, here it is. <laughs> um, so in early January 1895, a man named Milton Madsen was arrested in San Francisco on Larkin Street in the room of his fiancée, Ellen Fairweather, and charged with obtaining money under false pretenses. Matson was taken to the San Jose County Jail and locked up in a cell with several other men where he remained for two weeks until the jailer received a telegraph addressed to Miss Louisa Matson, care of the county jail, and realized that Matson was legally female. There was a lot of complicated legal wrangling. <laughs> Charges against Madsen were dropped, and he walked free from jail in men's clothing and returned to San Francisco the following month. Now, this exposure of Madsen's, quote, true sex generated a mass of newspaper coverage, and the San Francisco daily newspapers ran numerous stories on the male impersonator or great pretender, as they now describe Madsen. And if any of you are interested, you can just go down to the public library and look at these stories on microfilm, and they're like, like three or four page interviews, artist sketches, like for a little while Matson was a big celebrity in San Francisco. One of the things that the newspapers really fixated on and kind of like got public attention about was would Matson be arrested under cross-dressing law? Particularly now that they in particular had undermined his ability um, to go undetected by the law. Um, they also reported that Matson had like publicly kind of like dared the police to come and arrest him. But before that could happen, Matson was approached by the manager of a local freak show and offered a job. <laughs> to perform in the freak show, sitting on the stage as a woman who wore men's clothing. That's how the exhibit was built. And Matson, in need of money, um, accepted. And apparently Matson's um, freak show performance was very popular because other local freak shows then also began featuring similar exhibits that were billed as the only genuine Miss Matson in male attire. <laughs> and then Matson's manager sued the other freak shows and left a lot of evidence for people like me to do. Right. So as Madsen's case reveals, the relationship between the law and the freak show was really complicated. On the one hand, they operated according to very different logics. The law imprisoned, the freak show displayed. The law deprived its subject, the freak show offered a salary. The law disapproved and sought to reduce its subject's deviance. The freak show was fascinated and sought to exaggerate and increase it. But on the other hand, the operations of cross-dressing law and the freak show overlapped. Not only was Matson, like other freak show exhibits, recruited by a dime museum manager straight from a jail cell, his participation in the exhibition regulated his cross-dressing in a very direct way. His contract forbade him from cross-dressing on San Francisco streets, so as to preserve both the mystique, but also the profitability of the show. 
Additionally, the hypervisibility of cross-dressing bodies within the context of a freak show could have disciplinary effects that extended far beyond the performer communicate into audiences in starkly visual terms the parameters of acceptable gender behavior and the penalties for violating those norms. And this, I think, is really illustrated um, well by an 1891 novel um, called A Florida Enchantment, which some of you may be familiar with, in which a wealthy white woman swallows a sex change seed from Africa, um, transitions into a man, and then realizes with fearful horror that dying museums would love to exhibit him as the freak of all ages and the woman man. Finally, the freak show also produced what I think of as vigilant audiences who were being trained in the pleasures of suspicion. The possibility of being duped or tricked was central to Dime Museum entertainment, and showmen encouraged audiences to gain pleasure from suspecting, confronting, and unmasking frauds. Performances of sexual and gender ambiguity were particularly susceptible to this suspicion. For example, the bearded ladies and the combination of feminine dress and masculine facial hair confronted audiences with a fascinating gender dilemma. Was this a woman who pushed the female body beyond recognizable femininity, or was it a man in drag? Visitors sought to resolve this dilemma by, and they were encouraged to do this, by prodding at flesh, tugging on beards, and demanding to know the bearded lady's marital and maternal status. Freak show managers encouraged this kind of questioning as good for business, and sometimes staged confrontations that ended in court. Far from resolving the gender confusion at hand, such events merely reminded audiences of their susceptibility to being duped. And as such, freak shows not only reproduced the gender boundaries that cross-dressing law police, but also popularized them and democratized them, turning audiences into aware and vigilant judges possible gender fraud. Right, I'm going to end in just one second, but I want to end on a different note. I want to end by leaving open the possibility um, that freak shows could have unpredictable effects um, that <coughs> cannot be fully explained in terms of discipline or controls, which is what I tend to focus on. <laughs> um, as the cultural historian Rachel Adams has argued, freak shows were not only sites of disavowal where visitors distanced themselves from the freaks on stage to try to secure their own sense of normality. Sometimes they were sites of identification. Now Adams makes this argument in the context of African American audiences who would often go to freak shows and get take great pleasure out of unmasking racial freak performances as their friends and neighbors who were put in on a show for pay. But in the context of like gender freaks such as Madsen, I think the politics of identification could take a slightly different turn um, through attractions and desires that did not relocate the freak within the community of onlookers, but attracted the onlooker to the person on stage. Now, to be clear, I have no evidence whatsoever to back up that claim. Um, but I think it's important anyway to assert it, because otherwise, as historians, we just end up like replicating the structure of the archive, um, which sort of amplifies some voices and silences others. So there may have been people who appropriated freak discourse and freak shows for different purposes. Those voices did not make their way into the archive, right? Within the 19th century archive, the voice of the newspaper reporter is very prominent. So I want to end just by reading a quote from a, the, um, something that a reporter from the San Francisco Examiner wrote when visiting Madsen, um, this freak show performance, and this accompanied this image. Um, the reporter wrote, her part will not be a difficult one. She will be faultlessly attired in, patient, in patent leathers, a handsome dress suit, embroidered linen, and a white tie. She will recline in an easy chair on a little platform and chat with the socially inclined. But whether she will divulge any of the interesting secrets connected with her numerous love episodes is not definitely known. <coughs> so consequently, I want to end this presentation by just imagining the different ways that different audiences may have interacted with Madsen, with fascination and titillation perhaps, 
with discomfort and disdain, but also perhaps with identification, attraction, and desire. Once that, that law was in place, it could be taken up and used in all of these different ways. And certainly, um, there were first wave feminists who were convicted under these laws. Um, I didn't really get into this so much in my research because it began to happen like later on in the 20th century. But there would be considerable legal debate in court about whether cross-dressing laws could be applied to feminists um, because they would make the defense that they were wearing clothing that did belong to their sex. That, and a lot of the discussion in court that would then take, would then kind of like focus on, you know, whether women had a legal right to a particular cut of pants. A lot of the, the these fascinating courtroom discussions about how much material was used in the pants and whether this was the same as wearing men's clothing or whether it was feminists who were, you know, trying to redefine other types of clothing as appropriate for women. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's another kind of, there's a lot more research, I think, to be done about that. Yeah. Um, sorry, you oh. um, We talked about how there, they, there was an investigation into maybe moving and getting rid of Chinatown. Mm -hmm. Wasn't yeah. there also, at, after the fire, in, in 1906, there was a investigation of not allowing it to be rebuilt? Yes. And I think also, at one point, some of the body clay was found, mm -hmm. and there was a once again a investigation to get rid of Chinatown. And then my third question was, do you happen to know in Western Europe in the 19th century, I know, I know yeah. some of the German states are lost against Western Europe. Do you happen to know anything about Western Europe in general? Um, probably the same amount as you know. But what I do know is um, certainly in France, and um, you, a person could apply to, to the local police department to get a permit um, to wear clothing that did not belong to your sex. Um, so you could go and get like a little permit and you could carry it around with you. And again, this is actually, it gets back to your question about sort of first wave feminists or, or feminists in general. Um, so there would be um, women who just wanted to wear men's clothing but would make the case that they were not trying to disguise themselves as men, they were not living as men, they were not identifying as men, they just like to wear pants. And they could go to the police and get and apply for a permit, and sometimes they got it. Um, and then there were cases of people who were arrested here, um, and would say, who were from Europe, and would say, but I have a permit. <laughs> and, the, 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 and the permit wouldn't help them. Um, so that I, I, know that, I know that from France. I don't know if the same, I don't know that anywhere else. Um, and then, in terms of your first two questions, yes, <laughs> um, the, the, the attempts to um, get rid of San Francisco Chinese population continue under, you know, in many different ways, and often under the guise of public health. I mean, like the, the plague, um, after the earthquake, not wanting to rebuild. Um, what I was really focusing on here was the way that um, this, for a while in the 19th century, the Board of Supervisors continuously tried to expand the use of nuisance law. Um, and by trying to, and you know, a nuisance law was designed to say, like, your neighbor can't keep a pig, right? Or, you know, you've got to clean up your sewage. It was kind of like, it was this kind of, but in San Francisco and, and in other places, atypical bodies would be classified as a nuisance. Um, and that's what happened again and again in Chinatown. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, 
It's really interesting because obviously the, the nuisance laws also have to do with the imposition of a bourgeois mentality mm -hmm. on the working class. Because mm -hmm. it's the working class Absolutely. that has a lot of cross-dressing, that has uh -huh. what they would consider indecent uh, mm -hmm. sexual activity going on in public. Right. Um, what I, I loved your comment about what did this mean to a queer person looking at this person? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that history is the history we still have to figure out how to cover. <coughs> right. um, Thank you. The other connection I got was in, alone at least the 1890s, there was a huge number of cross-dressing, very well-paid performers, uh -huh. dancers, acrobats, all sorts of people like that, right. and how this actually, and in a way, we kind of have it again with the popularity of, of RuPaul mm -hmm. and stuff, yeah. that there's a fascination with people who are right. cross-dressing. Mm -hmm. That was going on then, and I'm not sure it was done in an oppressive way, it was a form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And the final thing I've always wondered about is this, this the thing between the Dime Museum and the folks on the street. Were the Dime Museum covered by the fact they were performers, mm -hmm. and the people on the street were not? Right. And therefore, performers are covered by, it's the theater, they can do that, but the people on the streets. I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, that, so um, I, I know pieces. So certainly, I mean, this is some of what I was getting out of this, trying to sort of create in this public-private divide. And there was, again, significant legal debate about these kind of like semi-public spaces, particularly performance spaces. So if somebody was on stage, were they, could they be um, arrested under cross-dressing law? And there was actually a fascinating case that took place around the turn of the century um, when, you know, we know that San Francisco and the Barbary Coast began to have, you know, bars that featured female impersonators, you know, as part of this sort of bigger vice culture. And there would be cases where um, there was this female impersonator who was arrested on stage under cross-dressing law and challenged that conviction and won. Um, and the judge, it was really, it was kind of this great ruling of like, you can do that on stage, but the second you step off the stage, you can be arrested. So then there would be this kind of like convoluted thing of performers deciding like, you know, should they, um, you know, should they change their clothing while on stage, right, to avoid, um, avoid arrest. Um, just in terms of the, the theater, there was this one thing that I found like, totally fascinating. So San Francisco had this chief of police for a while called Jesse Cook, who was like obsessed with like drag and uh, male and female and, and impersonators and, on the stage. And he kept these scrapbooks. There's like the other bank from the library. He has like 22 <laughs> scrapbooks in each one that is like this big, and they are filled with um, postcards of male and female impersonators. There were pictures, cartoons of him in drag. He liked to perform. He was part of a performance troupe. And then on the next page, you have the mug shots of people who he arrested on the cross dressing oh, right. And they're just there in these scrapbooks side by side. And you know, I don't know how he was thinking of those relationships, <laughs> but he oversaw like some of the biggest periods of enforcement. Um, so there's again, it's that you know, the sort of regulation, fascination thing side by side. I found a lot of body paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for bringing up, especially the like, phenomenon of slumming or whatever, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. because I know that like, you know, there were like the same, like there were kind of possibly similar, like respectable bourgeois, like people engaging in that kind of behavior and also like frequenting these kind of you know, vice district spots where cross-dressing performances happen. I wonder if that, uh, do you think of that as kind of a, co co like, one big phenomenon, or were these really kind of, like, did they really come out in specific ways? I don't know if that's making any sense. Like, could, could you say, what, like, yeah. when you said, do I think of that as, like, one big phenomenon? Yeah. Like, what? Um, <laughs> both, both these kind of, like, tours of, like, bodies that were, you know, specifically, like, viewed as degenerate or mm -hmm. racialized or whatever, and then also the like, you know, the like, whatever upper class interest in like these kinds of like cross performances mm -hmm. where that behavior would have been criminalized in any other context. Do you right. see these as kind of like 
different okay. expressions of a similar phenomenon, or were they kind of like distinct? I'm no, just I, I, if I understand your question, I do think they're related. Um, yeah. Partly because, um, you know, you can read these tour guides, there's lots and lots of tour guides in San Francisco for this period that you can read, and they'll describe, like, you know, you can go and you can go to the theater here, and then afterwards go to your hotel lobby, and you'll be picked up by a, uh, you'll be picked up by a, <laughs> by a local <laughs> police officer who will take you on a slumming tour. So it was often the, the very well-to-do visitors who would go on these slumming tours. Mm -hmm. And another way that I came across this was that some people who were arrested under cross-dressing law but were able to get the charges dismissed were wealthy white women visiting San Francisco who dressed as men to go on slumming tours because they had been told that you could only get into an opium den if you were wearing men's clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so I do, I, I do think they're all related, not necessarily in simple ways, but I think that really this sort of like culture of regulation and then you've got this culture of fascination and again this desire to see, you know, what is it you don't want me to see? And, and how did they justify those kinds of activities? Was it like for science? Was it like for like, like, <laughs> it was no, just pure energy? It was pure entertainment, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was also this like, you know, you, you know, you can't see San Francisco unless you go on a swimming tour, you know, you have to go back and tell your friends. Yeah. I was wondering, in your research, um, did you ever encounter like the cross-cultural um, mm -hmm. in terms of cross-dressing? Like, let's say for like Chinese, like Chinese women, working class women tended to wear pants. Mm -hmm. So now, were they, was this used potentially as a way to arrest and to ouster the Chinese or did yeah. you come across this kind of cases? Yeah, that's a great question. I had expected to find that and I did not. Um, I only came across um, the case of one person, um, one Chinese person who was arrested under cross-dressing law. Um, that was somebody who was classified as male who wore women's clothing, and he was turned in by other Chinese merchants. Um, that was the only case I came across. Now, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. So one of the things that anybody who studies San Francisco history struggles with is that, you know, everything from the 19th century gets wiped out in the earthquake, right? So, so many of the, all of the police court records, for example, are wiped out. So I could see the number of people who were arrested. I had that, and I sometimes had the months they were arrested, and after that I had to go to the newspapers to try to like, figure out who they were. And I was able to track down like 50 to 60% of the people who were arrested. I don't know about the other 40%, right? So it could be right that those other people um, were Chinese, and that was just not getting covered in the San Francisco newspapers. Or it might not have been, and it could have been that the, you know, the board of supervisors and the police had so many other laws that they were using against um, the Chinese community that they just didn't use cross-dressing law in that context. I really don't know. But that's what I, when I began this research, that's what I thought the story was going to be. Um, it didn't come out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, two comments. Would you talk a little bit about the period, like in the Compton, where they had to wear a sign that said boy? Mm -hmm. And the second one is, nowadays we think of cross-dressing as maybe like in the movie Tootsie, where a heterosexual man does it mm -hmm. for entertainment, or we think of it as drag, where you go down to a show where gay men do it because they like to dress as women, or we think of it as the actual people who are transgender, mm -hmm. who feel that this is the way they were born. Is there any way to differentiate historically one from the other? Mm -hmm. I think there's a any way to differentiate it <laughs> in general. Um, historically, I mean, of course, it's difficult to do that, partly because of the records that I was relying on. Um, I so rarely encountered um, the voice of the people who themselves were arrested. Um, and when I did, it was in a context they had no control over. So I would, occasionally I'd find newspaper interviews, like with Milton Madsen. Occasionally I'd find courtroom um, transcripts, as the case was Dick and Mammy Rubel. But still, it's like what somebody says in court or what somebody says to a newspaper reporter is not necessarily what you say to anybody else, right? Um, that said, there were, I did feel like I could at least come up with sort of a general sort of schema of the the range of people who were arrested under cross-dressing law. So there were sometimes people who, in newspaper reports, it would seem pretty clearly that they understood themselves to be a feminist and they understood this was part of a dress reform campaign. There would be other times when somebody, um, it seemed pretty clear that they did not understand themselves as wearing clothing that didn't belong to their sex. They understood themselves as having a sex that the law didn't recognize, right? So I could come up with general kind of ideas that this impacted a lot of different types of people, but I would not feel comfortable saying this person, you know, belongs here, this person belongs there. 
And then your, your first question in terms of, you know, kind of like how this plays out in the 1950s, 1960s, people kind of wearing that, like, I am a boy badge. I mean, at some point, I would love somebody, you know, to, like, look at, like, what happens between the sort of end of the 19th century and the, the 1950s. I'm not quite sure what everything that happens in between. Um, but there, there, um, there's something that I think has happened by the mid 20th century, which is why you can wear an I am a boy, which is around this idea of disguise, you know, um, not being in disguise, not duping people. And there was a, um, and there was some of that also that begins to emerge in the late 19th century. But I think there's, a, there's something to be traced there in between. Sure, one more question. I don't know what that <laughs> oh, well, can I can I just because you know can we can talk afterwards to so, so somebody back there? Yeah. yeah, actually my question connected a couple of the, the things that people have asked. Uh, I was reminded when uh, you, you were talking about Chinatown and the aftermath of the San Francisco earthquake, Phil Choi has written about how the pagoda architecture was partly an intentional uh, intentional rebuilding as a site that could only be used by Chinese merchants, that merchants would pay to have the, the very Chinese architecture to make sure that it remained in Chinese hands. Mm -hmm. In your own research, I wondered, and maybe this is a little bit like the, uh, the question that we heard earlier, in the, in the dime museums, in the, the freak shows, did you get a sense that the people who were operating those were facilitating the ability of people to do the things that they wanted to do? Or did you get more of the sense that it was much more of a make money uh, any way you've got kind of operation? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't answer that definitively, but I certainly got a sense it was more of the latter. Um, they, they, to me, they appeared, in, you know, exploitative, um, partly because there was this kind of general practice of recruiting people from jail. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> um, but again, that doesn't mean that everybody who performed in a freak show, you know, wasn't also like trying to just, you know, make the most of their situation and take advantage of the opportunities that the freak show could provide. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm just gonna make, I think we're good. I think, I think I'm moving <laughs> <laughs>